Well, good morning, Fellowship Church, and thank you so much for being here this morning. We're so glad you're here. Yeah, let's pra praise the Lord with me this morning, please. We have a great morning lined up for you, incredible music. Uh, we have a message out of the Old Testament today that really, really, uh, you know, kind of reflects today in a big, big way. And I'm just so happy you're here this morning. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in online this morning. We welcome you this morning. Uh, Pastor Gary's up in North Carolina, so if you wave backward, he'll probably see you because he's watching right now live. And uh, again, we love you and appreciate you. We love the Saltwater Worship Band. If you don't mind giving them a round of applause, hop into your feet and let's praise the Lord this morning and worship Him on this. Uh, we're, almost, we're on the right on the precipice of a, the birthday of this great nation. So again, thank you for being here. We love you. Before we start, uh always just say thank God we live in America we got the 4th of July coming up so we're gonna do a little something different but yeah let's sing uh, God bless America real quick we'll do it acapella unless you got a little something for me Miss Simpson let's see if I can remember the words God bless America land that I love stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans why with form oh god bless america my home sweet home oh god Bless America, my home, sweet home. One more time, God bless America. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. From the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, why with foam, oh God bless America, my home sweet home, oh God bless America, my home sweet Mitch, I don't have the order, so you'll have to holler him out first. Yeah, we're going to start out with multiplied. Across the skies, this 
of the song says I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life and sometimes when, when we're going through life that that goodness doesn't always show up the way we think it should and that's why God gives us faith to believe that he works all things together for for our good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose so even even when Times are tough and we're tested. And he promises that we will go through tough times and that our faith will be tested, but he's always there. His promises give us strength to believe in him. The song's called Evidence. All 
throughout my history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms make way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises in fulfillment All over my life all over my life Help me remember when I am weak The fear may go, the fear will leave You lead my heart to victory You are my strength
and it just states the simple truth that Jesus told us he is the way the truth the life no man come to the Father but by him so we're just gonna sing that truth and worship him this morning together so much. Y'all can be seated. Please be seated. Wow. Music. What a healing thing for the heart. Give you hope this morning. If you came in here hopeless, if you got a little more hope in your tank this morning, we thank you, Saltwater Worship, for that this morning. Thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and pray, and then Mr. Chris Brooks is going to come up with the announcements for us today. And again, we love and appreciate you. Uh, Pastor Gary is, like I said, he's out of town this week, but he's going to be back next Sunday preaching. 
So we look forward to that. If today's your first time here, uh, you're welcome here. We're so glad you're here. My name is Alex, but Pastor Gary is a, you know, he's about this much taller and he's about that much louder. He, you will hear him from the mountaintops. It's just a different ball of wax when he's here. He brings a whole other level of energy. Uh, and we love and appreciate him, and we'll miss him this week. But, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my very, very best to, to give you God's word today. And again, we love and appreciate you. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we humbly come to you today because today is your day. And, we're, Lord, we're laying it all on the line with you in hope of being the best reflection of you that we can be. Help us learn today, Lord, how to be more like you. Help us be today Christ-like to the people that are hard to be Christ-like to when we're out and about in the community, in our own homes today, Lord. Help us learn to follow your example. And Lord, we just pray for that person today that's struggling. We pray for that person who has a broken heart today. We pray for that person that doesn't know you personally, Lord, that has no idea what even that means about having a relationship with Jesus. We pray for that person's heart to be softened today, Lord, and they may receive today's message. And Lord, we just love you. We thank you. Everything that we have is because of you, O oh Lord. And the hope and the music we just heard is all inspired by your act on Calvary's cross. We love you, Lord, and we say this in your holy name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Good morning, church. How you guys doing? Well, if this is your first time with us this morning, we'd like to welcome you to fellowship. Um, like Alex said, Pastor Gary is away this weekend, so uh, our services are usually filled with a little more energy. Our pastor's really loud if you haven't met him yet, and he's a, he's a big ball of energy for sure, so we're going to try to fill those shoes this week. Um, but we want to thank you for visiting us this morning, coming out to worship God with us. And um, If this is your first time, take a minute and meet us out here at the table. There's a little gift guest registry for you to fill out. We just want to know how you heard about us. Um, tell us a little bit about your walk, and then we like to give you a free gift. We're not going to bother you. We're not going to come by your house, anything like that. We just like to let you know when we have events going on around town. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our online audience. You guys are awesome, solid. Our snowbirds that go up north for the summer, they stay in touch with us online. We've got people actually from all around the world who watch us online. We just really want to thank you guys for tuning in. And if Facebook's ever given us problems, you can go to that watchfclive.com. We're always streaming live there if Facebook happens to give us some issues. And this is our first communion of the summer. So today, after each service, we're going to be meeting out here by the crosses to uh, take Lord's communion together. So we'd like for you all to join us after the service today for that. And then tomorrow night at 6 p.m., our Fishers of Men Disciple Maker group will be meeting. Um, we've got big things happening in that group, guys. We're taking along, you know, new believers or people who aren't quite sure where they stand in the Bible, maybe they have some questions or whatever like that. So we got a more experienced man with a little less experienced Christian, and we're just walking through life together, developing some really authentic relationships there and just building the kingdom. Uh, we got friend to friend fellowship. This actually will not be this next week, um, obviously because it's going to be the 4th of July. So our schedule is going to be a little changed. They will pick back up next Tuesday at 1 p.m. for our friend to friend fellowship here in the worship center. And then we've got Grief Share uh, this Wednesday at 4 p.m. Grief Share is a great program if you have loss or you're just dealing with some grief in your life. There's going to be a group of people there who've been through it. This is what we've been called to do. We're not supposed to go through things like this alone. So this is why we have these meetings. We have church. We lean on each other. We can share our grief. We can share our experiences and our problems with each other. And then right after Grief Share... We've got a great service for Celebrate Recovery, and that's if you have any bad habits, any hang-ups, any hurts. There's another great support group there. A, you know, they have a great worship service. Um, they're going to feed you at 6 o'clock. This is right after that grief share, so if you want to just stay, you can stay and eat and then stay for the Celebrate Recovery. They break out and have these discussion sessions, and it's just a great time of getting into God's Word and, and growing with each other on Wednesday nights. Man, we're going to be giving blood next Sunday. We've got the big red bus is going to be parked out here um, in the parking lot. So right after each service or before or after. So they're going to be parked out here pretty much all Sunday morning. Um, guys, take time and donate some blood. Giving you lots of stuff. Giving you lots of stuff, yeah. 
for sure. Um, then we're having our patriotic night. This is going to be our high school, middle school blast group next Sunday, 5 to 7. I'm assuming it's at the Heegs. So it's going to be at the Heegs. So get with Jen or Adam um, for more details on that. Make sure you get plugged in, get your kids plugged into that because um, that next generation needs it for sure. And this is our town. We say that every week. Let's make that true. If you're from somewhere else, like I am originally from Georgia, I have made this my home. This is my town. This town matters to me. The people here matter to me. The kids here matter to me. So let's get the word out about our church. Let's give them a place where they can come, hear the truth of God, you know, come and worship with us on Sunday morning. So just put a bumper sticker on your car, slap a magnet on there, get a t-shirt. They're like five bucks. If you can't afford them, they'll give them away. Um, it's, a, it's just a beautiful way to get the word out about our church. And when, again, we always thank you guys for your cheerful giving. We have an amazing, amazing group of, of givers here. Um, God just blesses us, and we're just good enough to bless him back. And we, we've got a few different ways. You can give online. We've got the text to give. Um, really easy way. You can sign up, just like a reoccurring charge kind of deal, or pick how much you want to give each week. And then, of course, the old school send it to, to box P.O. P.O. Box 121, uh, which is pastor's favorite old school way to just go check the mailbox. Um, but again, we thank you always for your gifts um, so we can do what we do here in the ministry. And join us right after this service. In between first and second service, we've got free donuts, coffee, there's juice, nuts, and M&Ms. There's all kind of good treats and stuff out there for you. And it's free as always. Um, so go, you know, have some fellowship time in the, in the lobby afterwards and get yourself some coffee and a donut. And again, we thank you guys for being here this morning. You could be anywhere on Sunday morning, but you came and you chose to worship with us. So thanks for being here. We love you guys. All right, so we got one more song from Saltwater Worship coming up. And you all can stay seated, and then we're going to do the offering and all that good stuff. We'll ask you to stand for that prayer time. But for now, please rest your feet. Love and appreciate you. Oh, just think you got a couple words to say about this song. Well, I guess a little bit. I love this spreading out thing. This is great. Right? That's what I'm I saying. Do. It's always just been me, and I don't really talk It takes that three of us to fill his pastor's shoes. So. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but uh, we're doing something a little different uh, this week. We're going to do a song we did last week called Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, but it's a completely uh, kind of like it's a completely different rendition of the song. Um, and I'm going to, because my dad's not here, that's why I'm able to do this. He would never let me do the same song two weeks in a row. But, uh,. I don't know. I'm, I'm, we might do another version next week, too, and that'll really drive them up a wall. <laughs> but anyways, just turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Thank you again. Yes, if you don't mind standing for just a moment, please. Beautiful song. Thank you, every thank you, Saltwater. We really appreciate you so very much. Amen. <laughs> it's time for our offering this morning, and we just humbly come to you this morning in, in gratitude for all of your faithfulness in the past. Uh, one of the foundational things that we've said here since the beginning that Pastor Gary came up with. He always said, like Mitchell referenced earlier, thank God we live in America. And another one that will be here as long as we're here is, if you can't give cheerfully, keep it. And if that's the first time you've ever heard that here, it, sound, it can almost sound like an ugly statement, but it's not meant to be. We understand how people view church, and we understand how people view money and church, and how the world does. And we also understand that this is a time of worship for us. It's an offering to God. When we, when we tithe, it's our way of giving back a little bit of what He's given us. 
So if today's a day where you're feeling like, you know, you, you don't want to give that money, you, even the Scriptures teach about how you leave your offering on the steps of the altar and go deal with whatever issue you've got going on in your heart before you give that offering because it's considered a moment of praise. Whenever they, you know, uh, uh, sacrifice an animal or burnt incense, it was, a, it was an offering to God, directly to God. So that's how we view this this morning. And we, we thank you for your generosity. Um, anything you give today is going to go towards the general workings of the church. Uh, well, last week, everything went to that, that, that kids' wing, future wing, that are going to have all kinds of stuff going on over there. And uh, we just thank you so very, very much for your giving again. We love and appreciate you. And Kyle, brother, do you mind if I call on you to pray this morning? Kyle's my brother in the Lord here. He's part of that Fishers and Men group. He began it. He's a big chunk of uh, what, we're, what we're doing here, and we... Love and appreciate you, man. He's got a beautiful family. You're going to get to see his little girl get baptized here in a second on the big screen. Yeah. So thank you all so very much. And please, after, go ahead and sit down, uh, get comfortable. And uh, Roger put together a beautiful uh, photo montage of the baptism that happened this last Wednesday, just in case you missed it. Thanks again, brother. Thank you, Pastor. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for loving us. Thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness that you've shown upon our lives, Lord. We just ask you to be with Alex as he gives us the word, and uh, we just ask you to bless this offering, use it for your good use, and just uh, continue to bless us in all the ways that you have, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this town, and uh, we just give all glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you,
What an awesome evening. 36 people were baptized. 36. Several of them were on the beach, just happened to be on the beach. And they walked up and they professed their faith in Christ. And, and they baptized them right then and there. It was a beautiful thing. I, I, if you were there, you, you, you got to experience it. And uh, I, I just can't encourage you enough to plug into one of these events when we're, when we're out there uh, doing this out there in the public like that. It makes a statement for our community, for our church. And uh, again, we, we just love and appreciate you so much. We thank so much everybody who worked so hard on Wednesday, starting off like a middle of the day, loading, unloading. It was like 150 degrees in the shade, and they just fought through it. Poor Roger almost went down at one point because of the heat. I mean, it was brutal, but everybody muscled through it for the glory of God to get these people baptized and to be that witness in our community. So again, we thank you all so very much for doing that and being a part of us that day. And uh, Ronnie asked me just to remind all you guys that they're taking, you guys are taking the day off tomorrow from your Bible study. So don't show up tomorrow night because you'll be locked out. So again, thank you for being here this morning. My name is Alex Christie. I've been here uh, with Pastor Gary and with Roger and with Dina we, since 2002 when we started the church. Uh, we're very, very blessed to have the same group of folks that started this ministry. And we've grown in some different directions, but you know, the, the, the core group of us here have been here since day one. And it's just been a privilege to work with all these folks for all these years. And uh, again, we're just so grateful. Can't say it enough. But we're going to continue on Pastor Gary's Lest We Forget series. And uh, he asked me to do something a little patriotic. And it was hard. It was hard to be truthful. I love my country. I have so much respect for our veterans, people who have done things that I I've never done, I couldn't imagine doing. And, and, and I stand on those people's shoulders today. I couldn't be up here speaking publicly with freedom to do so if it wasn't for people who fought and died for the values that this country was founded on. We're so very, very blessed. And if you're one of those people here today, we thank you so much. But like I said, it was hard to be patriotic. And this isn't going to be a left, right, blue, red rant. It's us. It's we, we have some work to do because... Everything starts at the foundation. Everything, you know, the idea of the top making a difference on the bottom only happens when we let it happen. If we change the foundation of how things work on the base level of our families, of our community, of our town, we can make dramatic change in this country and in this world. So today we're going to go way back in time to the book of Deuteronomy. And it's kind of, there's a lot of really cool history here. This is actually, the val I call it the Valley of Decision. And that little city there in the, between these two mountains is Sketchum. And the cool thing about that is the first time it's referenced is in the book of Genesis. Because when Abraham leaves his hometown, when God tells him, you're, you're leaving. And this is all after Babel happened. And God said, listen, I'm just going to pick a pet project. I'm going to pick one guy. And I'm going to start a whole new tribe with this one guy. And that's what he did with Abraham. And this is like the first stop that's referenced that Abraham did when he was traveling to the promised land. So this city has been here forever. And on one side you've got Gerzim, which is this mountain that is considered for blessing. And still to this day... Samaritans, remember Samaritans in the scripture? Samaritans still practice. They are kind of like an exiled version of the Jewish people. They, they broke away many, many, you know, thousands of years ago now, but they still function there. When you read the story about the good Samaritan, these are the people that Jesus was talking about and that the Jews hated. They called them dogs. But a small group of them, very, very, very religious to their, to their version of Judaism, still function because this is Samaria. And on top of this mountain, it's all gated off because they still, during Passover, to this day, sacrifice animals during Passover to God on this mountaintop. They're still practicing right now. 
And it, it's amazing because if, if you listen to, they believe like Noah's Ark landed here. They believe Eden was on top of this mountain. This is like a very, very holy site to them. And then when you jump over to the other side, Ebal, this is the mountain of, of curses that are referenced in the book of Deuteronomy. And the cool thing about that, recently in 2000, 2019, excuse me, 2019, they found tablets. And something I learned through this study is when you watch like Charlton Heston come down off of the mountain with giant tablets, that's not necessarily what it was. The tablets that they find are usually about the size of maybe a business card. And they actually are able to, now they're kind of petrified and solidified and sometimes they can open them up but they're like little booklets that they make. It's phenomenal, the technology that's thousands and thousands of years old. And they've recently found curse tablets on top of this mountain back in 2019. A lot of people, of course, you know, you've got both sides. Whenever it comes to archaeology, you've got one that says one, one that says the other. So it's always kind of a toss-up uh, on who you're going to listen to. I listen to both sides. I think they make a very, very compelling argument for the side that it is a, a legitimate cursed tablet, which makes this very interesting because back then, cursed tablets were always thrown into water wells or into holes in the ground because it was all about cursing somebody who stole your boyfriend or whatever, and, and you know, you're talking to like the, the underworld about it. You know, you're not even reaching up to God. The, the pagans weren't even reaching up to God. They were just looking down. So to them, for them to find a cursed tablet on top of Mount Ebal, on the very site where they have uncovered an altar that was built, which we'll get to that in a second, is a pretty substantial archaeological find. And a lot of people are, are comparing it to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is also a tremendous find many, many years ago. So this is a big, big deal. So yeah, and then they got that valley of uh, Sketchum there where you and I are, are standing right now because the Israelites were given a choice. Curses or blessings, and we're going to get into that right now. So we're in the Valley of Decision, and so the, the, before the people of Israel were able to enter into the Promised Land, they were given a choice. They had to choose what they were going to do. If, were they going to lean on blessings or get cursed? God gave them an option. And just like our founders did, when they started this great nation of ours, they had to make a choice as well. To do things the way they've always been done or look to Scripture for how God would want things done. Now, I know when we look at our founders, we have this idea of these incredible men of God, and it's true. They stepped out, they put their lives, their fortune, their families, everything on the line because they believed in this nation. They wanted to break away from England. And the first thing they did, as soon as we broke away, let's do it again. Let's get a king. And they took George Washington, and they said, let's, we're going to make you a king because, you know, we want a king. And he said, no, 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 no. We're not, we're not going down that road again. And he didn't even want to be president. But he was so worried that they were going to create another monarchy here, he, had, he agreed to become president of the United States, our first president. And it's an interesting contrast because when you read Chronicles, after Moses dies and Joshua leads them into the promised land, and then after um, they settle, the first thing they do is they want a king. And God says, you don't need a king. You've got me. I've given you all you need. Nope, we want a king. And then the nightmare begins in Israel right away because we're not looking to him. We're looking to some person. We're putting all of our trust in a person, and we do that today. We look at our, our politicians, we look at different leaders, and we expect them just to take care of it for us. And they're incapable of it because they're just as messed up as we are. I mean, it, it's, it's preposterous to think that somebody, because they're well-spoken, well-dressed, and they tell you everything you want to hear, is going to have your best interests at heart all of the time. We are fall, fallible people, and people get paid off, and all these things. And that's what happened to the people of Israel when they chose to have a king. And things went terribly. You should read it. It's, it's a great, great stories. But now, we're also as a nation in a moment where we have to make a choice. 
Now, we, we're not going to obviously do away with our, our, our system of government. We're not going to change anything in that regard in a great way. Over time, the hope would be that we could. But what kind of a choice do we have today? Right here at home, with your family, with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with your work associates, with the people here at the church, with the person who cuts you off down the road, the person that's driving you crazy at the restaurant or not packing your groceries right at Publix. We have to do, are we going to do things our way? Are we going to continue to do things our way, the way things haven't been working properly? Or are we going to go back to God and do things His way? Because we have changed. We've always been sinners, we, and we've always been a mess, and we've talked about that just a second ago, way, way, way back. But people here in this country used to believe in something. And even if they didn't have a faith that included Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, there was at least a respect for God. There was a respect for those that believed in Him. Not everybody. I'm not, and I don't believe in a believe it, leave it to believe, uh, leave it to Beaver world. I know that didn't really exist, but it was better than it is today. People were scared to curse God in public, mock God in public. It wasn't something you did, and if you did it, you were chastised for it and run out of town because people wanted the blessing of God on them and in, on their families. So we have changed in that respect, but God hasn't changed. He still demands this of us, demands it of us. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't forget that. The same Jesus that was there at the foundation of the world is here with us today. The same Jesus that died on the cross for you, only you, had you been the only person that accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, he would have died on that cross for you. He has not changed. So we're in that valley of decision of Mount Gerzim for the blessings, Mount Ebal for the curses, and here we are in that old city of Shechem. So now we're going to jump into Deuteronomy 27. And uh, we're actually going to cover two whole chapters, so we're going to breeze through 27 a little bit with the, with the curses. I'm going to kind of, you know, break them down a little bit for you. And uh, it's just that Moses really wanted to remind his people, remind the people of Israel one more time. Now, this is the end of the book of Deuteronomy, okay, just about the end. There's like three or four more chapters to go. He had already gone over the Ten Commandments, all the other laws, and, you know, but he's wanting to reiterate right now that before the people crossed that Jordan River, that there was a cost, there was a price to get into that land of milk and honey and for it to be what they were promised it could be, obedience. Now, that's a tough word. None of us like to be obedient. We love it when people are obedient to us. But when it comes time for us to be obedient, it's hard especially if it goes against something that we like, something that we want to do, something that feels good. But we can't live forever in this mindset of do what you want whenever you want. That's not how it works. And we'll get into a little bit of why later. So Moses commanded half of the tribes of Israel that would stand on Mount Gerzim to proclaim a blessing over the people. And the other half must also stand on Mount Ebal to proclaim the curses that God would send if his chosen people didn't do as he commands. They were told to record the curses on a stone tablet, which they may have just found, maybe not. Like I said, I don't know. But the thing is, it, even if it's, it's, it's ancient, there's no doubt that little thing I was talking about a little bit ago, that little half business card uh, tablet thingy, even if it wasn't the one that Joshua put up on that mountaintop, it would be setting a precedent that people believe that this was what happened there. And they went back to commemorate it because this is a thousands and thousands of years old. They, they're able to, to date it by the materials that it was used uh, to make it. So it's amazing. So curses set on stone tablets. And they wanted to go ahead back one second. I'm sorry, Roger. And build an altar and sacrifice a peace offering. 
That's a weird one, right? You build an, you're gonna, now you're going to write down all these curses on tablets, and then you're going to build an altar. And God actually tells them, have a good time. Have a peace offering. Make it into almost like a party because they're sacrificing an animal. Now everybody gets to eat. And this is something that God's doing on purpose. Everything he does is on purpose, of course. But this is a picture of you've got this mountain with curses, and you're, you're, you're slaughtering innocent blood. Are you picking up on it yet? Innocent blood on this mountain of curses. It's amazing the foreshadowing of Christ we're seeing here. Because these tablets are getting covered in, a, in the innocent blood of an animal. Because as human beings, you know, we're image bearers of God. We're the only ones that are really capable of sin. Animals can't sin. So whenever you slaughter an animal, it's an innocent animal. I know there's like mean cats and stuff, but... You know, I mean, chances are it's like either they were abused or just, you know, they're just angry cats. But it, it's, they're not sinners. We are the only ones that are capable of sinners, being sinners. So when they, when they kill an animal, that innocent blood was a picture of Jesus Christ. So how do you get yourself cursed? Now, remember, we were, we, he went over all the Ten Commandments and all the other little lists of things. But this is always God's number one. To have other gods in secret or publicly. Now, only you know if you've got a god in your closet. And I'm not talking about a Buddha statue. I'm not talking about any of that other stuff. I'm talking about you know whether or not you're putting something over God in your heart. You know if, if God's not your number one priority. And so often, I, I, you got to think of it this way. We're talking about eternity here. We're talking about the all-powerful God who created everything, not just earth, not just you, this entire universe that we have no understanding of. He made all of it. So we should give him all of us. Dishonoring your parents. God is very familial. He's big on the marriage picture, on the parent-child picture. He's always painting how the importance of the family We've destroyed the family in our country, and, but he's always painted the picture of its, impre its uh, importance to be intentionally cruel or misleading to people. It actually talked about intentionally misleading a blind person. I guess that was a big thing back then. Like, you tell a blind guy, no, it's that way. Just send him off in the woods. I, I don't know. But there, it, was, it was enough to that God told him to write it down, not to be mean to people that are handicapped. Deny help to foreigners, orphans, or widows. To be sexually immoral or perverse. That's a big one. We love to point fingers at specific things. But we all have those thoughts. We all have those struggles between the world of just going through the uh, social media and all the things that are flashing up in front of our eyes all the time. And here he's actually talking about things as far as incest, bestiality, all kinds of stuff that was going on back then. But we can't be a sexually immoral nation. We can't be an adulterous nation and expect his blessings on us. And of course, having violence toward our neighbor. And then the murder of the innocent. The sixth commandment is not thou shalt not kill. We mess that up sometimes. We say, thou shalt not kill. It says, thou shalt not murder. There's a big difference. There's a big, big difference. The innocent, and everyone gets the reference to the, uh, the abortion issue, to hurting children, just to walking into a house and killing somebody for no reason, to rob them of their stuff. That's how you get a curse. So all of this was set in stone. And cursed is anyone who does not affirm and obey these terms, the terms of these instructions. So, after each curse was laid out, the people had to say, Amen. Now, remember, you got half the tribe of Israel on one mountain, the other half on the other mountain, and you've got the Levites, the holy men, the, the people that were um, the, the priests of the day, shout, shouting out these curses. And all of the people had to say amen may, or may it be true. So it's kind of like when you look at your kid and you tell them, you know what's going to happen if you do that, right? Uh-huh. And then they do it anyway. 
And then you got to follow through with it, unfortunately. But the thing is, they were having to affirm it. And this was a contract that they made with God, an agreement, because God also had a good side for it. But He wanted them to really make sure the bad side, the curses side. So being in that valley of, of decision, and when it comes to the blessings, they don't have to say amen, build an altar, or burn an offering. Why? Simply because if God says it's going to happen, He's going to do it. He will do it if they listen to Him, if they don't do the things He's saying not to do. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all His commandments, what I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the world. The world's going to wonder at them. Look how prosperous they are. Does that sound familiar? We're, as far as Americans go? You'll, be, you'll experience all of these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. We used to be known as the breadbasket of the world. It's not anymore. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and your breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will counter your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction, but they will scatter from you in seven. He's not even telling them they have to fight back at this point. He's, he's, he's going to take care of it if they listen. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. He wants to bless them. He wants, to, to, he wants them to be a shining light. Because remember, not that long ago, Babel happened. And now, like, now the nations are all under foreign little gods. And they've, they've fallen away from him. And this is his chosen people. And he wants those people to look at, him, at, at those people and say, that's the true God. He wants them all to come back. He wants all the nations to come back to him. And he wants Israel to be that picture of why. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see you, are the people claimed by the Lord, and they will stand in awe of you. The Lord will give you prosperity in the land. He, will, he swore to your ancestors to give you, blessing you with many children, numerous livestock, abundant crops. The Lord will send rain at the proper time. I love the specificity of that, the proper time. Not just rain whenever, rain when they need it. From his rich treasury in the heavens and will bless you for all the work you do. You will lend to many nations, but you will never need to borrow from them. As a nation now, we are $32 trillion in debt, which I guess breaks down to about $100,000 per breathing person in America. Before you even start in life, like a baby, $100,000 in debt right away. That's not a blessing of God. That's not his calling for us. I know we're talking about the people of Israel here. But I believe if people, if the nations follow him and they honor God and they do what he says, he'll bless them as well. He wants them to be an example so that we can follow it. If you listen to these commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, and if you carefully obey them, the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You will always be on top and never at the bottom. You must not turn away from any of the commands I'm giving you today, nor follow any other. There they are, gods, and worship them. Don't put any other gods before him. It's a big deal. It's adultery. You're cheating on God. That's how he views it. He, and he feels the same way we feel if that happens to us. That brokenheartedness, that, that dirtiness, that, that, that disdain, that pain, that's how he feels when we cheat on him. But if you don't, don't say I didn't warn you. Now God's, you know, he's letting them know all these blessings, but he's also letting them know here that Israel is going to be the standard one way or another. 
He's either going to bless them to the point of where the world's going to be like, what on earth is, are they doing right over there? Or they're going to get hit so hard, they're going to be like, oh man, that's an angry God. But if you refuse to listen to the Lord your God and do not obey all of the commands and decrees I am giving you today, all of these curses will come and overwhelm you. Your towns and your fields will be cursed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be cursed. Your children and your crops will be cursed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be cursed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be cursed. Now this is a hard one. The Lord himself will send on you curses, confusion, frustration, and everything you do. Until at last you are completely destroyed for doing evil and abandoning me. How do you wash that with the, with the loving Jesus that we, we sing about? The sacrificial lamb on the cross who died for you, in place for you. He's also the judge and when, and when at the very end of time, he's going to be sitting on that, th- on that Bema seat, and he's going to be the judge. And, and what kind of a judge can be taken seriously? How can God be called righteous if he doesn't follow his own rules? He sets a standard. He lives by them himself. And the only way he can be God And the only way he can be righteous enough to judge the entire universe is by setting a standard and sticking to it. He can't be wishy-washy. He can't go, oh, these are my chosen, so I'm just going to let you be. You know, you guys can, I'll keep blessing you no matter how you act. And then I'm going to, you know, everybody else is just going to suffer with the consequences of not following me. He has to be an honest God, a, a righteous God, a righteous judge. So if you feel today, do you feel confused, frustrated, and cursed? I know I can. If I watch too much news, I wonder, where are we going? What are my grandkids going to do? I feel like the world can come to an end any second. It's not going to. I don't believe that for a second. I don't believe that for a second, but you can feel that way. You can feel so overwhelmed. But what we do right here, right now matters. And saying that we're followers of God even isn't enough. We have to live it. We have to be that salt and light. It's your opportunity, even in the hard times. There's a beautiful scene in, and I know there's like been lots of controversy about it, so forgive me for referencing it, but there's a beautiful scene in the last season of The Chosen where one of the apostles, he's, a, he's crippled. He's got a bad leg. He's got a crutch. And... Jesus is sending them out two by two into the, into the region, and he's, you know, they're going to be able to heal. They're going to be able to cast demons out. They're going to be able to do the things that Jesus did, do these miracles. And it's, this part isn't in Scripture, but it, it was a beautiful moment still where he comes up to Jesus and goes, well, Lord, you, you didn't heal me. How can I heal others if you don't heal me? And the response was, how much more? Powerful is your testimony because you're healing people of something you're suffering from. And how do we put that into our context? If you've lost a loved one, how much more powerful is your testimony with somebody who just lost a loved one than somebody like me who's been blessed? And I, had, I, mean, I lost my father, of course, and he, I loved him dearly, but it's different than losing a child. You can't compare those two things. And I couldn't, I can try to be comforting, I can try to be loving, but by the grace of God, I've not experienced that. But if you have, it's your time to be able to step forward and help somebody through that tragedy. And you can put yourself in any of those positions, any position you can think of, any kind of hurt, any kind of struggle, it's your chance to shine as a believer in Jesus Christ, having that faith in Him that all things will be made right in the future. And show that to somebody who is maybe at the end of their rope, maybe ready to completely give up. And that's when you can shine the the brightest. Because our actions always cause reactions, we shouldn't be surprised that our country is falling apart. We've kicked God out of everything. I mean, when you think about 
when a horrific situation happens and there's a shooting at a school, everybody's heart breaks. Everybody is frustrated, angry. We want vengeance. And half the world goes, where's your God now? Well, the answer is, wherever you put them, because you kicked them out. What do you expect them to do? What do you expect these children to do when they're taught that they come from an amoeba, that they're an accident, and when they die, there's nothing anyway? It's easier just to, to do something horrific, die, and it's over. The suffering is over. They don't even understand that eternity is going on after they close their eyes for the last moment. We're, 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 we're ruining our children. We're selling them short and there's no, hope, there's no reason for them to have hope if they don't think they're fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image. There's power in that. We are supposed, he gave us his image so that we could control this world for his glory. Just like he wanted to make Israel special. He wanted to make the whole world special. We have to go back to him. And because we're, we, our countries are falling apart, we shouldn't be surprised our families are falling apart too because it starts at the family. It's not Joe Biden. It's not Donald Trump. It's not, you know, go back as far. You can, you can name all back, back to George Washington. We love to blame other people for the mess that we're in today. Granted, some of it's out of our control, and I'm not saying that these people don't do horrible, stupid things, and they just, frankly, they do more often than not. But at home, we can make a difference. We can give our children hope. We can let them know that they're loved, that they matter, how much value they have. Teach them about God. Give them, do the homework. Don't just say it and then expect them to hear it here at church because they're not going to always hear it at church. There's distractions going on. You have to be active at home. And that goes for you too. Things are going to happen in life. Things are going to get hard in life, and then you're going to go, why, God? And that's okay, and that's understandable. But if you give yourself a solid, strong basis, a foundation in His, in His Word, in faith, you'll make it through anything. And that's what you've got to give your kids and give your grandkids. So that's the value of the decision we're in today. What we have been doing isn't working. So... It sounds terrible, but we could just throw in the towel and quit. We could just give up. But we should give up. We should give up in our ways and submit to God's ways. It's all spelled out in there. And you may be sitting here today, and if you haven't gotten into your Bible, and all the stuff I just read, it sounds like it's just like a, a, a stereo instructions of a rule book. But it's not. Because don't forget, at the beginning, there was that sacrifice on those tablets that shed blood of an innocent animal that God offers a way out. But how can I know today what is God's will for my life? I'm glad you asked. It's a tough one for a lot of folks, but it's not, it doesn't have to be as tough. You start at the basics and you start from there and go on. You have the law versus grace. The Old Testament is the law. We are in a time of grace. I'm not saying the law doesn't matter. I'm not saying the law isn't important. But grace covers the law. If we listen to Jesus, what he said in Matthew, and he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love the neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So what, what I'm saying is the first five of the books of the Old Testament essentially just wrapped it up in, in two verses. Jesus made the way for us, and this is how we start. We put him first. How do we love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and your mind? Through obedience to him. What does that mean? You're going to go home and whip yourselves, you know, stop doing everything fun. You're just going to, you know, cloister yourself into your bedroom and read Scripture 24-7. That's not what he wants. That's not what he's suggesting. But the only way you can get to know what he does want and what he does desire from us in that relationship that he's created with us is by reading God's word. Get into a Bible study here at Fellowship Church. Get into one someplace else. Just get into one. And if they're preaching out of the, out of the Bible, it's a good thing. 
Don't do this by yourself. You don't have to. So stop doing what, you've, what you know you should be doing, the way that's failing, if you haven't noticed. Doing things the way that has always been done and wondering why things haven't changed for the better is craziness. We all do it. Trust me, we all do it. And when it's somebody else doing it, we look at them and go, why can't they see it? So often we're doing it ourselves. When I counsel somebody, after, after a little bit of time, I like to ask them, what advice would you give somebody you love facing your situation? They have answers. They, have, they, they know what the truth is. It, when it, if it was their child or, or their sister or their brother or their parents, they know right away, wow, I would give this advice to them. Well, but I don't want to take it myself because that's hard. But they know the hypocrisy right away, and it's something that we all struggle with. So start living God's way. That's how. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind getting into His Word, coming to the church, treating people the way you want to be treated is essentially what some of the Scripture teaches, because there is no other way. If you want to make this country better, you want to make your families better, your community better, your, your children, we have to do it God's way. If we do this, the second part about loving your neighbor is easy. They may not be the most lovable person. You may want to choke them to death sometimes. But you know what? So are we. I got a little bumper sticker on the back of my car. And if you saw it, it says, Jesus loves you. True. Underneath it in small print, and I'm working on it. Also true. We're tough. We're tough, aren't we? We make it hard for us to always love each other. But that's where Jesus steps in. The level ground at the cross is where we get things taken care of because he's done the work. So either way today, you're making a choice. You're choosing your blessings or your curses. You're choosing to do, thing God, do things God's way or to keep doing it your way. And I just encourage you today to, again, plug into a Bible study. Make some new friends here at the church and just grow in the Lord so that you can receive the blessings he's promised you while here. If you're a saved Christian today, and if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have these blessings on the other side. And all of, the, all of these curses that we heard today, when Jesus Christ was nailed to that cross and hung by his own body weight, he took those curses for you. He took all of that pain for you. He gave you an out. And if you don't remember the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, I can't encourage you enough to do that today. Don't leave here today. Don't go do communion here today. You might choke on the communion wafer out there. Crazier things have happened, and there's no going back. There's no second chances. So if you don't know the Lord today, I just encourage you to pray along with me, and then we're going to go on out and do some com and, um, have communion together. And uh, I just really, really want to make sure you have this locked in, in your heart, that you know without a shadow of a doubt you've accepted Christ as your Savior. And I call it as easy as ABC, to accept the fact that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. I'm not saying you have to understand it. I'm not saying you've got to sit here and try to explain it to me and prove it. Believe in it. That's the faith part. And choose. Choose heaven over hell. Ask him into your heart. Put all of your chips on Jesus. Trust him with all of your heart. Give it to him and don't turn back. So let's pray. Father God, we, we humbly come to you today, Lord, and we thank you for your, your holy word. And Lord, we thank you for a chance to, to come to you today and put all of our sin on the table for you so you can take it from us, Lord. And make us holy in, our fa in your Father, our Father's eyes, Lord. So, Lord, today I humbly come to you and I pray that I, I admit that I am a sinner. And I ask you, Lord, for forgiveness of my sins. I trust you, Lord, to take my sin on you so that I may be admitted into heaven at no work of my own. I love you, Lord, and I thank you, Lord, for this time. And thank you for dying on Calvary's cross for me, Lord. And we say this in your holy name.
Amen. Thank you all so very much. God bless you all. And we're going to do communion outside in just a second.